I want to bring in today's agenda panel. We have Zerlina Maxwell, who is a contributor for thegrio.com. Igor Volsky is managing editor of Think Tomas. He is a special correspondent for Newsweek and The Daily Beast and editor of the journal Democracy Gang. It is great to see all of you. Zerlina, I'm going to start with you on this because the Politico article goes on to say that Hillary Clinton's allies, sometimes with her participating in all this, are doing what you'd expect to build the presidential campaign. Obviously, they need to have that foundation laid of what the dateline is. Uh, super PACs though and other outside groups are also lining up waiting for the dispensation of a blessing. Mm -hmm. uh, but is all this happening too early on? Because in politics, isn't it all about when you get hot? And then you got to be able to ride that heat wave to the finish line. I certainly think it's it's a little bit too early, but on but on the other hand, I think we have to be. She has to lay the groundwork for mm -hmm. for an effective campaign, and that that means that you have to start early. You have to start on the ground. You have to build those email lists. But for me, really, what I'm looking um, to Hillary for is how is she going to play a role in the 2014 midterms? Is she going to be a queen maker? And I say that um, with regards to uh, Wendy Davis in the gubernatorial race in mm -hmm. Texas, but also um, the Senate race in Kentucky. She going to be on the stump um, energizing uh, the Democratic base to come out in the 2014 midterms, which would set her up in a really big way for 2016. You need to pick and choose wisely if you're going to get into that business. Igor, the Politico article also talks about the concerns, the potential rifts that have formed in groups in Clinton world and the inability to control the messaging. So how big of a threat do you think that could be as the early telltale signs of setting up a campaign are there? Well, I think what they learned from 2008 is that you don't want to go into this campaign with kind of the public perception that it's a foregone conclusion that she's the nominee. That was a big mm -hmm. mistake last time. They don't want to repeat it. But I think the biggest revelation you saw in the political piece is that nobody knows. Nobody knows if she's going to run. She doesn't know. And so it's astounding to see these early stories, these uh, all these people coming together to work on a campaign, Thomas, that might not even exist right, right. now. Well, and there's such an appetite because of what this means potentially for our nation's history and what it means to the uh, young women across this country and to, to just other people that are looking for that type of change. But Michael, let me ask you about this because uh, as Igor points out, this foregone conclusion uh, that, that she's going to run, uh, is that the biggest issue because of the potential of loss and the fact that people would advise her, you got to take critical thinking into this because do you want to go out on a low note? Uh, well, look, you, you, there's always a risk involved in uh, in taking that step. There's no question about it. But I think a lot of people in the Democratic Party, Thomas, uh, really, really are hoping that she does this because uh, if she doesn't run, uh, you look at the candidates after her and you look at their, although some of them are very uh, admirable people, you look at their ability to win nationwide, uh, there's a pretty clear drop off right. from Hillary Clinton to the second tier. Uh, I'd also like to say that I thought uh, the most interesting aspect of this article for me uh, was uh, how it signaled there that there are going to be a lot of new people in Hillary land, as it's called, uh, this time around, if she does run. Uh, she has been, and I followed her 2000 Senate race very closely, and from her years as First Lady, through that race, through her re-election campaign as Senate, even through the State Department, been a pretty steady group of people, advisors, people that she's been close to. People tend to stay very loyal to her. Uh, but now, apparently, there's going to be a lot of new faces uh, in a 2016 campaign if it happens. And that will be an interesting thing and will make for a different flavor of campaign, I think. I always think, though, if this happens, that if the first spouse turns out to be Bill Clinton, the, the, the only way that this could work to a guy's ego is if he's a former president. But I'm just saying that. Uh, anyway, <laughs> our other topic today, Kentucky Republican Senator Rand Paul uh, announcing that he's suing the Obama administration over the NSA spying practices. This is all in an effort to protect the Fourth Amendment. Now, I just want to play a small portion of what the senator had to say yesterday. Take a listen. The point is, is that one single warrant should not apply to everybody who has a cell phone in America. One of the things that Snowden released was a single court order to the company Verizon that all of their customers' records would be looked at. That, to my mind, smacks of a generalized warrant. That's what we fought the Revolutionary War over. All right, so we go with the senator here really tapping into uh, a, a very... Uh, provocative narrative about privacy and the culture of privacy or lack thereof in the country right now. What's the bigger political motive? 
Well, I think politically this is a really smart move. He puts himself out there as a leader on this issue, and this is something that can really start to peel back at the Obama coalition, uh, to peel back at some of those young voters. It can help him moving forward if he makes that bid for the White House. I mean, he already has some 50,000 new names on the list he's building, and so it's really a win-win for him. It gets his name out in terms of conservative voters. He's coming into this race now as the guy who's suing the president. That's a pretty good positioning if you're talking to conservatives in the primary and trying to convince them to vote for you. It's certainly good for headlines. So, Michael, let me yeah. play what fellow Republican Congressman Peter King said today uh, about Senator Paul. Take a listen. Hmm. He's playing on some sort of... Uh, uh, Fear-mongering. I, I don't know, libertarian... You know, Scare-mongering, isolationism, and rather than using intelligent arguments, as people could well do, he's resorting to fear. He's appealing to the lowest common denominator. Is that accurate that he's appealing to fear, Michael? Um, I wouldn't put it quite that way. Uh, King might be also, in his own way, appealing to a kind of fear. Peter King might run for president also in 2016. He's thinking about it very seriously. He's from the more hawkish, Dick Cheney, neocon wing of the party. So you have this very clear feud uh, going on and, uh, you know, embodied in these two people who are going to be going head to head on these two issues on debate stages if both of them run, as it is expected that both will. And uh, Where's the Republican Party going to be in 2016 on these questions? I have a feeling it's going to tilt a little bit more in Paul's direction than King's. Ms. Erlina, would you say that that is the way it's going to go political move-wise? If you're planting seeds that you want to reap, presidentially come right. 2016, is Rand Paul planting the proper seeds? I think so, but I think that there's key groups in the Obama coalition that he these moves do not court, and that that is women, black voters, and Latino voters. He's really done nothing. I think, I mean, his war on drugs rhetoric is effective, but it, it's not matched by actual policy. Um, he's, he's, I've, I've inter interviewed him recently. He said he's going to propose um, new legislation in the coming year, but I still think he, he has a lot of work to do with those constituents because you know, he supports personhood amendments, uh, and he also um, is against portions of the Civil Rights Act, which, last I checked, is not going to uh, get a growing coalition of black right. people behind you. So you need those groups to win a, pres a general election, and I don't think he's done real work with those groups. That's not the call to diversity that he's looking for. Right. Uh, Griot or <laughs> Lena Maxwell. Uh, Think Progress is Igor Volsky, The Daily Beast, Michael Tomaski. Thanks to all of you, and for more, you can find our panel.